Yes, yeah, so sorry, so sorry for the delay, everyone. Um, even after two years of Zoom, con problems continue to surprise us all, um, but we try our best. Um, before we go into our introduction, I'd like to start with a uh, land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the, Gai the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono's dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono's people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Um, so greetings again, everyone. Um, my name is Nikita. I am one of this year's deep grad student co-chairs. Um, we'd like to extend our thanks to all of you, both in person and on Zoom, for joining us today. With, um, and what a beautiful day it is to have um, our speaker come. We had two days of um, rather snowy weather, so it seems like sun has come to greet you. <laughs> um, and for all of those joining us, for the first time, the Ronald and Jeanette Gaddy Lecture Series is a weekly lecture series held every Thursday at this time during the academic year at the George McTee Kane Center for the Advanced Research on Southeast Asia, eliciting engaged conversations between scholars across all disciplines in Southeast Asian studies. We're happy to enjoy, again, the delicious return of the Gaddy tradition with the catered lunch, today um, being catered from Tamarin here in Ithaca. Um, so anyway, with that out of the way, I'd like to uh, pass it off to my fellow co-chair E to introduce our illustrious guest. Okay, hello everyone here in the Cajun Center and hello on Zoom. Sorry for the delay. Um, so I am E, uh, Elisa Domingo Badike. Um, I am one of the co-chairs uh, this year. And I'm personally very excited to introduce our Gaddy speaker today as she is my fandom studies, performance studies, and new media studies mentor. <laughs> All the things. Uh, so, uh, let's give a warm welcome to UC Berkeley's Abigail DeCosnick, who traveled all the way from sunny California to, you know, an icy Ithaca that's start, starting to warm up a little bit. <laughs> so um, Abigail DeCosnick is an associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Berkeley Center for New Media, uh, BCNM, and the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. She is also the director of BCNM, and is the 2020-2025 Craigslist Distinguished Chair in New Media. She is the author of Rogue Archives, Digital Cultural Memory and, Me and Media Fandom uh, on MIT Press uh, 2016, and co-editor with Keith Feldman of Hashtag Identity, Hashtagging Race, um, Gender, Sexuality, and Nation uh, from the University of Michigan Press 2019. She has published articles on media fandom, popular, digital culture, social media, and performance studies in third text, Cinema Journal, now Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, the International Journal of Communication, Modern Drama, Transformative, Transformative Works and Cultures, one of my favorites, uh, Verge, Studies in Global Asia's Performance Research and Elsewhere. She co-organizes The Color of New Media, a working group focusing on technology and intersectionality. And the cosmic is Filipino American. <laughs> so, if we could all give a warm round of applause for Professor De Cosmic. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today and for being on Zoom. Thank you to E and James and Nikita. And um, oh, are you okay? <laughs> okay. And thanks to SEAP and um, the Gaddies and Cornell. It's great to be here. It's my first time at Cornell and in Ithaca and it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, thanks for arranging this awesome weather for me. Uh, today, I'm gonna be um, talking about the many piracies of Brides of Sulu, a 1934 film. Um, although, is it a 1934 film? This is one of the things we'll be talking about. Oh, you know what? I can't advance these slides. Um, See. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is from my book in progress. Uh, it's originally titled Pirate Bodies, 
and it consists of chapters on different kinds of bodies of users who identify as media pirates, um, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, sexual and gender minorities, and disabled people, and how they pirate media. So one of my um, main topics is how bodies matter in matters of media use, and how the body of the public or polity has been divided up into individual bodies who must uphold or remake or maintain, for example, library infrastructures, which is one way that I argue pirate archive function. So the concluding chapter will be this one, which is about my body, my Filipina American and transnational body, my Spanish body, my body that responds strongly to specific stimuli, um, specific intellectual kinks, uh, for example, particular instances of fandom and piracy, as well as fandom and piracy as widespread phenomena, um, as well as Philippine and American media more generally. Those are all of my intellectual kinks and um, not all of them, but those are some of them. And, uh, and also my physical body that flies between the Philippines and the United States, and my psyche and my memory and my affective body that flies between those places, as well as many historical periods and media formats and genres and ways of telling stories and ways of knowing. So the, the concluding chapter will be about stuff I'm into, stuff that affects me, um, places that I go between, genres that I go between. And in this, uh, in um, talking about piracy, I'm referring to three types or genres of piracy. So one is seafaring piracy. The next is unauthorized acts of copying and reproduction, and not just in recorded media, but also in performance and narrative. And the third type is acts of plunder. Um, these people use piracy, that word piracy, quite broadly. So illicit and unofficial taking or seizing or, or appropriating. So the first kind of piracy, I'm going to talk about many piracies, as I said today. So the first kind of piracy is the subject matter of actual pirates, seafaring pirates. So there was, in 1931, a silent film produced called Moro Pirates uh, in the Philippines. So it was directed by Jose Nepomuceno, who is called the father of Philippine cinema, a very um, productive director in the 20s and 30s. And this film presumably focused on uh, seafaring Moro or Muslim pirates from the southern islands of the Philippines. And Moro Pirates is, like all Filipino silent cinema, lost. We do not have uh, a surviving copy of this film. Um, Teddy Ko, who is a film historian and an archivist and chair of the cinema committee of the National Commission for the Culture and the Arts in the Philippines, says there are no Filipino silent films that are extant. All of them are gone because we didn't have a proper archive and maybe 80% of the films made in the 1940s, 50s and 60s are gone. Our film heritage is very important. It is us, good or bad. Filipino films are about the Philippines and the soul of the Filipino. Um, so this quote is about this regret at this archival loss, this absence in the archive. And so we can only kind of speculate what was this 1931 film, Moro Pirates, about? Um, is probably linked to the Moro Rebellion, which lasted from 1899 to 1913. Uh, Moros, as I said, are Muslims inhabiting the Southern Philippines, and they rebelled against the U.S. colonization that started in the Philippines in 1898. And they had earlier rebelled against the Spanish uh, colonizers, and later they rebelled against the Philippine Republic. So Moros were constantly in rebellion, but the U.S. was probably most concerned with them rebelling against the U.S. Uh, imperialist uh, regime. So some of the American soldiers that fought in the U.S. war against the Moro rebels were veterans of the Indian Wars against indigenous peoples in the United States. And uh, they brought with them this mentality that was common in the US Army um, combating indigenous fighters, that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And there was a kind of analogous slogan that was used in the fight against the Moros that was um, civilize them with a crag. And this is a crag, um, this, uh, this particular kind of rifle. Um, it was called, it's now referred to more often as the Philippine Constabulary Rifle. So you could just get a sense from that slogan and from um, looking at this crag rifle of the kind of violence that was inherent in the war against the Moros in particular. 
Okay, the second act of piracy is a suspected act of Hollywood piracy of two 1931 Filipino asylum cells, and one of them is Moro Pirate. Um, the other one was a, a leather lost film called Princess Tarhada. So, did a U.S. production company, which is called Exploration Pictures Company, edit these two silent films together and add a musical score and American narration to create the 1934 release, Brides of Sulu? Now, this is an article from 2011 from the Philippine Daily Inquirer that had the headline, Archivists Reclaim Two Silent Philippine Films Pirated by U.S. Film Fest, which is the Filipino Silent Film Festival, the International Silent Film Festival in Manila, Film Fest opens Friday. And um, this is describing the two archivists, Teddy Co is one of them, who um, had hypothesized that Bride of Sulu an American movie was actually made these two Filipino silent movies um, produced it a few years before. And I circled again the word pirated, which is a term that um, I think the archivist used to describe uh, this re-editing project. So this is a still from the film, and this is a summary in Turner Classic Movies. Bride of Sulu is still available on um, DVD today, and you know, Turner Classic Movies has like a website for it. So Brides of Sulu, uh, I won't read this whole thing, but it's basically a Romeo and Juliet story. It's about the daughter of the leader of the Moros who has the title Datu, um, and the daughter is named Benita, and she falls in love with a non-Muslim, a Christian uh, named Arsan, and um, they have to Oh, actually, the wrong name is given of her character in this <laughs> summary. But uh, they have to run away in order to marry. But the Datu sends all his men after them, and they recapture them. In the end, it's a happy ending. Um, Arsan agrees to convert. And so they are allowed to marry at the very end of the movie. OK, so now we're going to play uh, a little over six minutes of Brian Sulu. So yeah, I'm going to ask E to dim the lights. All right, and what's important about this uh, six and a half minutes is that it's unredacted. So you can watch Brides of Sulu or a version of it on YouTube, but um, there will be lots of bits missing, I noticed, uh, when comparing the DVD version, which this is, to the YouTube version. Uh, a lot of the really racist uh, parts of the film are cut out of the YouTube version, interestingly, but they're still in the DVD version, so here it is. Yes, you agree, though, the 
Okay, could you please turn on the lights? Thank you so much. All right, so, um, you know, what's interesting about that clip or this whole movie uh, is that despite the racist and xenophobic narrative uh, narration, um, it is an act of failed piracy because if Brides of Sulu is an attempt by a US production company to copy Filipino films and remix them with American narration and framing in order to justify the US colonization, which is an attempt to replace the original with the pirate version, an inexact copy motivated by imperial politics, then it does not succeed. Much of the Philippines from 1931 persists in Brides of Sulu despite the intentions of the American pirates. As Vivian Angelis says, the film is rich in ethnographic information, which the narration, uh, which the narrator ignores. 
So I think of Rise of Sulu as an archive of the Southern Philippines in the early 20th century, or possibly as a reconstruction of earlier periods, you know, because if one of the films cut into Rise of Sulu is Moro Pirates, then it may have been um, a recreation of the 19th century or earlier Moro Pirates actions against the Spanish. So it's unclear how much of this film is actually trying for a kind of earlier, uh, you know, Filipino way of life. But in any case, uh, if you went to the Southern Philippines today, where I am from, um, you'll see many scenes like this, you know, in um, in use right now. So uh, we could see the Nipaha, uh, the Vintas, or the outrigger canoes. Um, this traditional way of making bolo knives and other types of, uh, of edge weapons are preserved in a way by um, Brides of Sulu. So, you know, despite the film's intention, it gives us this um, visual record of um, actual, you know, legit activities going on in the Philippines. Um, this marketplace that, you know, to, this is something that I think has changed from the 1930s to today is Filipino marketplaces now are heavily congested, affected by a lot of pollution, you know, lots of motorcycles and tricads all around, um, billowing with like diesel fumes. But this is a record of an earlier era of outdoor Filipino marketplace, which is um, clean and tidy and, you know, pollution free. And I think it's important to have this group. Um, and also, of course, like the beautiful natural resources, natural environment of the Philippines that the film um, puts on celluloid, uh, the gorgeous waterfalls, um, these underwater sequences, uh, the film gives us all of that. Um, so I think what is a bit uh, challenging for me, though, is that this instance of American failed piracy is you know, potentially a successful act of archiving. And I've written about how piracy is, can, can be archival uh, in the past. Um, so it could be an archive of two previously lost Philippine films, and it could be an archive of this particular period of the early 30s in Philippine history, if it's not entirely filmed as a historical drama. And so this act of American piracy um, frames the Philippines as this anti-archival place, this anti-technological culture. Uh, so while pirate archiving yields surprises and successes, the fact that only this American pirate version remains ties in with the very prejudices and biases that the Brides of Sulu narration is trying to put forward, that the Philippines has no civilization of its own, that it lags behind um, American culture by 500 years, you know, this idea that only the U.S., and Western advanced cultures maybe understand what film technologies even are. Like remember the narrator says, they've never seen a camera before. They don't even know what it is. And so the fact that Filipinos didn't preserve the, their silent films and they may have only come through the ages down to us through this American piracy sort of resonates with that narrative about the Philippines that Filipinos didn't understand the technology of film well enough to bother even preserving it. And Louis Colin has written about um, how the Philippines has lagged behind other nations in its um, state funded uh, archival efforts of film. So if you skip to the bottom of this uh, block quote, um, basically uh, there was no national film archive in the Philippines until 2011. All right, so moving on to the fifth part. So both Philippine uh, filmmakers um, of Moro Pirates and Princess Tarhada and American filmmakers of Brides of Sulu are copying earlier sources. Uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, for example, uh, the balcony scene is kind of recreated in Brides of Sulu, which I'll show you in just a moment. And similar tales of star-crossed lovers, of course, Romeo and Juliet is based on the myth of Pyramus and Thisbe. Uh, we have the tale of Tristan and Isolde and many sort of star-crossed um, romances like that. So if you could hit the lights once again, I'll just show you the balcony scene because the, it's a lovely scene um, worthy of uh, being viewed.
Okay. Thanks so much, E. All right, so there are more pirated sources that may have fed into uh, Brides of Sulu besides um, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, possibly F.W. Murnau's last film, Taboo, which was uh, he directed it for a U.S. studio. If Brides of Sulu is constructed from two 1931 silent movies, the influence of a 1931 Murnau film might be uncertain. But in terms of Brides of Sulu, which was released in 1934, Murnau's film would have uh, been an influence on that, along with King Vidor's Bird of Paradise. And regardless of what influence, you know, any films influencing um, any of the Philippine films, you know, Tarjada or Moro Pirates, um, Jose Buencosejo says, uh, building on Nick Diocampo's work, that the cultural imperialism of Hollywood was already etched in the local, meaning Philippine imagination by the 1930s. So even without looking for direct influences, the influence of Hollywood um, is present, uh, Buencosejo says. So here's a couple of stills from Murnau's Taboo, where you can see the island, you know, the beautiful island setting of um, lovers being thwarted. Um, the same plot is at work in King, Vido, King Vider's uh, Birds of Paradise, uh, the two lovers pictured here. And um, there were also many sources uh, from cultural genres that were being um, performed on the regular in Manila. So there's a, a Zarzuela, a musical play called Minda Mora that premiered in 1904 in um, the Manila Opera House uh, by Severino Reyes and uh, Juan Hernandez that was about a Muslim girl, a Moro, who falls in love with a Christian man. Um, and he, the Christian man's already engaged to a Christian woman, but the Moro woman falls pregnant by him and becomes the object of the Christian woman's pity and benevolence when uh, she tells the Christian man, the Christian woman tells the Christian man he has to take responsibility for Minda and their child. Um, by the way, this is like remarkably reminiscent of the plot of Miss Saigon, you know, Madam Butterfly, Miss Saigon. So I'm just noting that continuity too. And Isadora Miranda traces this history of representation of Muslim characters in Tagalog literature and theater during the time of the Spanish colonization. So from the 16th century through the 19th century. And this history of incorporating Muslim characters into Spanish literature um, was in place since the 18th, since the 8th century Reconquista. Uh, the 8th century is when Spain reconquered the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors or the Moros, the Muslims who had seized um, much of what is now Portugal and Spain. So that tradition of making plays that incorporate Muslim characters and feature them heavily was an important part of Spanish, you know, literary traditions. Um, and the Philippines reproduced that tradition into all of language literature. 
Um, so there was this other play also, La Alianza Soñada in 1902, that um, depicts Muslims as invaders of Luzon. So this kind of um, barbarian invader trope that like, what if the Southern Filipinos came into the North and tried to take over the Christian Philippines? And strangely, um, Lapu Lapu is a big character in that play. I say strangely because Lapu Lapu is from the Visayas. He's from more of the South. He's a, a famous Cebuano historical hero. And um, his army, by the way, killed Ferdinand Magellan. That's where Magellan's journey, you know, ended was on Mactan Island. And so Lapu-Lapu comes to the north, comes to Luzon and defends the Philippines, the Christian Philippines by allying with the Christian Americans. So that alliance of the American Christians and the Filipino Christians against the Muslims is a really important concept that's being worked out in Philippine literature in the, um, the early years of the American colonization of the Philippines. So there's a centuries long tradition as well as this contemporary trend in the Philippines of depicting Muslim characters and communities to showcase, first of all, the backwardness, simpleness, um, barbarity of Muslims. Second of all, to showcase the goodness of Christian, Christians. And thirdly, to kind of argue that Christians of all nations and races have to align against Muslims. So Spanish Christians, uh, Filipino Christians, and American Christians all have to sort of view Muslims as the enemy. Um, and of course, we can see in art culture, you know, these trends continuing, the sort of demonization of all Muslims vis-a-vis -vis all Christians. Um, Okay, later Brides of Sulu was pirated as a source. So Brides of Sulu in 1934 gave rise to um, another instance of this kind of uh, piracy uh, in terms of tropes, in terms of story and narrative and these Christian Filipino logics, which is this film called Zamboanga. And Zamboanga from 1937, which by the way was directed by the male lead of Brides of Sulu, the, the guy who plays our son. So Zamboanga is the oldest surviving Filipino talkie. As far as anyone knows, it's the oldest surviving Filipino film and it's from the sound era. And it's a film that Frank Capra called the most exciting and beautiful picture of native life, by the way. So. Um, it had, you know, it was greeted with um, enthusiasm in its global release. And here are some stills, or here are just some paraphernalia stills from Zamwanga, um, the star-crossed lovers, the poster, and, you know, this interesting depiction of the characters as barbaric love pirates. What does that mean, that they're love pirates? Um, okay. So a note on the fifth piracy is that the fifth piracy is about filmmakers copying plots, themes, sentiments, attitudes, staging production styles from earlier books, plays, movies. I'm, I'm only using piracy rhetorically here. I don't think it's, I think it's totally fine to reproduce these things. Um, but the fifth piracy is in the mode of repertoire. While the second piracy that I talked about obviously earlier, which is filmmakers cutting two films together and layering a narration to make a new film is in the mode of archive. And here I'm drawing on Diana Taylor's distinction between repertoire and archive. Repertoire and archive are both forms of cultural memory. They are forms of passing stories and lessons and character types and ways of knowing and doing from one generation to the next. Um, what is being transmitted across time by these repertory and archival acts. First of all, an anti-Muslim prejudice and a pro-Christian, pro-colonial bias to be sure, but also these convoluted paradoxical ways of framing the Moros and Muslims as heroes and as villains, you know, heroes because they're brave and they fight. And they're, by the way, fighting for the Philippines against the colonizers. So they're heroes in that way, they're also villains. You know, they're kind of stand-ins for failed revolutionaries, um, like the stand-ins for Aguinaldo's army, for example, that rebelled against the um, U.S. Um, colonization. And they're also emblems of brutally resistant and separatist minority groups. So in this interesting way, they um, represent all these different parts of the political map uh, in all of, in, you know, this long tradition. And it also depicts the Philippines as a site of mixture, combination, intersection, overlap. Um, but in these films, um, mixture, for example, like the intermarriage between people of differing religions or cultures is depicted as inherently and deeply fraught 
and a cause for conflict. So like the underlying premise of Rise of Sulu is like where there is this mixing, there is trouble. Um, ironically, both of the leads in Brides of Sulu are mestizo. They're both um, Filipino and white American. So they're biracial in essence. So they are mixed in their bodies, but um, yet it's trouble if they you know, get together. So, all right, the sixth hierarchy is that uh, it's more about what's happening in recent years, like the last 10, 20 years, which is that the US um, characterizes Filipinos and all other Asians as intensive media pirates, as people who steal from the US because they copy, they endlessly copy and illicitly access US media. So, here are just a few headlines, you know, the survey that showed. The Philippines is among the highest in online piracy in Southeast Asia, nearly half of online Filipinos, uh, as opposed to offline Filipinos, I guess, admit to using streaming piracy websites or torrent sites. Here's uh, some kind of survey that shows that the Philippines pirates more Netflix and Disney than any other place in Southeast Asia. And um, these sorts of depictions of the Philippines and Asia in general as like the pirate nations of the world, um, Kavita Philip just notes how often that is argued, even by kind of pro-piracy scholars like Lawrence Lessig. So uh, Kavita Philip writes, the multiple new artistic and cultural forms um, that arise from ripping and mixing are Lessig's examples of transformative uses. That is, uses which transform the, con the content of materials out there, she's talking about remix culture, um, or which transform the markets they compete in. This is good piracy because, you know, it's mostly like white Western piracy. But in, in the Lessig, Philip is arguing, bad piracy is Asian piracy. So she has this quote from Lessig. Um, in which Lessig says in his famous book, Free Culture, all across the world, but especially in Asia and Eastern Europe. And then later on in Lessig's writing, these Eastern European references just totally drop out. Uh, there are businesses that do nothing but take other people's copyrighted content, copy it and sell it. This is piracy, plain and simple. This piracy is wrong. So Philip says within the space of three pages, Lessig asserts numerous times and firmly enough for his followers to understand that Asian piracy is deeply wrong and excusable, unjustifiable because of its flouting of bourgeois law and the laws of the free market. Something about Asian piracy completely um, undermines the logics of like the, you know, Western civilization. <laughs> so that's what's the problem with it. Um, so any discourses or characterizations of Filipinos as improper copyists need to keep in mind that the colonization of the Philippines by the US was justified by President McKinley's view of Filipinos as the little brown brothers of Americans who needed to be paternalistically educated in how to be American, how to be modern, how to be civilized through a process the US government called benevolent assimilation. Um, so the US got involved with the Philippines presumably to make Filipinos into copies of Americans and they forced Filipinos to copy American culture. And these acts of linguistic and cultural imperialism have long outlasted the period of governmental colonization. They resulted in Filipinos often performing what I call perfect covers of US vocal performances um, throughout the world in entertainment industries and in call centers, for example, and in Filipinos admiring US popular culture through what I call the mechanisms of forced fandom, which is when people have no choice um, you know, a political situation um, absolutely compels a people to become fans of um, some other cultures, um, cultural products. Okay, the seventh piracy, I just want to, I won't argue this point very long because I think it's still evident. Um, seventh piracy is colonialism. Colonialism is piracy and colonizers are pirates. Uh, Spain and the U.S. inaugurated the plunder of the Philippines' natural resources by foreign nations, which goes on today, and the poaching of its people through what we call brain drain. So um, let's not forget who the real pirates are uh, in this situation. All right, the final piracy is the eighth piracy. And this is more of a reflection on what piracy is to Filipinos today, um, and maybe always has been. <laughs> piracy is something like a state of being for Filipinos. We have pirated and been pirated for hundreds of years, and we will continue to evolve with and through piracy for the foreseeable future. We need to 
born, what was pirated from us, what was stolen from us, which is not just possibly these two films, but the ability to represent ourselves, to define ourselves to the world, and even to define ourselves to ourselves. That was taken or appropriated by our colonists. But while we grieve how other nations' acts of piracy have robbed us, we also need to honor what our acts of piracy have given us. We need to recognize that we have been forced to replicate foreign cultures and that we have chosen to copy foreign cultures inside and outside of, and sometimes in defiance of, officialdom or authorization. In the 21st century, a connection to original Filipinoness, like original Filipino silent films, is lost to us. But we have copied much in our bodies, in our individual and collective beings, and those appropriations augment us and make us. Our truth is that we have been copied and downloaded, and we have copied and downloaded. So we exist as a mixture of many piracies. We can lament the absence of our originals, but not get lost seeking what we will never find, which is unrecoverable, authentic origins or originals or originality. We were forged in the scrum of pirate fights, we have inherited the wounds and weapons of plunder. We can acknowledge our pirate genealogies and grant ourselves pirate pride. We are still sailing the seas where messy, unpredictable wars over post and neo-colonial cultural, social, economic, and political relations are fought. We are a motley crew. Often we lose and sometimes we win and enjoy the prizes we seek. And always we remain in the mix. Thank you so much. Um, and let me just say caring is sharing. So I have posted on Twitter a link to the full unredacted Bride of Zulu. So feel free to go to my Twitter and watch the movie from uh, Google Drive. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So um, we are now going to, oops, yeah, we are now going to go into the Q and A portion of our um, of our uh, lecture today. So um, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and alternate between in person and Zoom questions. And um, I see a question from Talk. Um, and if you'd like to come up or okay. Yeah, I I love that term appropriation too, and I do think that appropriation has a positive charge for some and a negative charge for others. So I think that one of um, Kavita Phillips' points about how appropriation is viewed based on who is appropriating is that it is raced and it is defined by geography too. So it's fine if um, white male teenagers in America appropriate any form of digital culture and remix it because they're learning skills that they might need as engineers or they're becoming, you know, they're building their cultural literacies or something or gaining fame as a YouTube star or something like that. But, you know, her point is that the same people that defend those forms of appropriation characterize Asians as pirates. Um, so that when it's when it's uh, from that perspective, it's mere copying. It's not original at all, and um, you know this whatever skill building might be going on is not honored or recognized. So I do think part of what I'm playing with is the perception of whether an act is appropriation or whether it's seen as mere copying, aka piracy. Uh, but thank you for bringing that up because I do think that. It's, you know, it's like beauty in the eye, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, whether an act is appropriation or piracy, it's similar, I think. It depends on where you stand and where the, the appropriator or pirate stands as well. Um, but that, thank you for, for raising that 
you know, that, that differing worldview. But I agree with you. I mean, it's fine if, I also think appropriation is good anywhere. Like that's how culture travels. Uh, that's what it means for something to be in repertoire is to, is to constantly be reconfigured. Yeah, well, I'm also I also agree. <laughs> so we have a Zoom question from Jane Goldman. Um, and they ask, I'd like to ask if you could comment on what seems like, oops, let me just uh, not block the camera. <laughs> I would like to comment on what seems like a relevant situation depicted in Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing. I'm assuming you've seen the film. Uh, if not, please ignore. But in that film, for anyone who hasn't seen, the documentarian invites perpetrators of the Indonesian genocide of the mid 1960s to reenact their crimes and feelings based on their passion for American cinema. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I haven't seen that film. So I will add that to my list. Thank you so much. Um, I think that reenactment is something I am trying to deal with here, too. So uh, when I say that some of the acts of piracy I'm talking about are in repertoire and others are in archive, I think um, that film that uh, you just described, and I've seen that written up before, too, is a film that is trying to separate out the archive from the repertoire. So it's trying to do something in particular with um, reenactment and reperformance in the body, um, as opposed to um, exactly copying these uh, violent killings from the perspective of photography or from the perspective of um, if any film exists from that time, the time of the genocide. This film is not about that archival reproduction. It's about a repertory reproduction. So that I think is really interesting because it brings up this question of what happens when cultural memory is transmitted through this bodily reperformance um, um, what work is done, what changes are made, what distance can be held between the new embodiment and the old embodiment, as opposed to, I mean, it's never a simple act, but as opposed to, you know, inserting um, film or audio or photography taken at the time that the acts were committed. So what is, you know, what is it when cultural memory is transmitted through archive as opposed to repertoire, I think is a really great question. It sounds like that filmmaker is trying to get at that question. I mean, can you have an emotional distance if you just reperform it as opposed to staring at photographs of um, murder? You know, what, what is that, what is the, what is the difference? Um, so thank you, I have to see the film, and, uh, but that's, I think, what I would be asking myself uh, looking at that project. There's a similar project with Schindler's List, with, in essence, interviewing all the people that were extras in Schindler's List, and then recreating parts of it, and what surfaced in that was how much uh, none of the extras wanted to be Jews, they all wanted to play German. And I think that's remarkable because, um, you know, where does history fall? I mean, to want to occupy the um, positionality of the villain because they survive is really radical, you know, it's just a really radical finding, I think, from that project. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a great question and answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, ooh, sorry. Um, let's see, do we have any in-person questions? Oh, James, please. Uh, I just want to ask about Yeah, or a non-believer. Yeah, yeah, I caught that too this time. Yeah, actually in the balcony scene, I just caught a reference to the Spanish architects. So that I would say is the one place where Spain is um, put front and center. I think to justify, uh, you know, why does this building look so different than the Nipah huts 
that um, the film really concentrates on in the beginning. So it attributes them to Spaniards. So that's one way out of the film's own logic of uncivilization is like, well, there were some Spanish people here before. So that's why not all the buildings are made of like twigs and leaves. Um, yeah, I think that it's interesting that you say the, uh, the film foregrounds the failure of the state to quote unquote civilize this part of the Philippines. I mean, this was, you know, at a point in the colonization before the US ever imagined letting the Philippines go. So I think it actually justifies this imaginary future in which the US state will be able you know, finally <laughs> to educate these people. Um, but that future was not to come to pass because in five years time, the war will be, you know, well, in, in, in more time, you know, in, in um, let's see, seven years time, it'll be in the Philippines proper. But even before the Pearl Harbor and the war comes to the Philippines directly, uh, the war in Europe was already affecting, you know, the way you, the US was thinking about its colonies. So I think that um, at, in 34, you know, the US and like most colonial nations in Europe did not imagine the massive decolonial efforts that would follow World War II. Um, so we have to view it from their perspective and not our own where we know that any of these attempts are just doomed, you know? Um, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Thank you. We have a Zoom question from uh, Dean Nguyen who is joining from Vietnam. Um, is asking, oh my goodness, where did it go? Uh, okay, um, thank you. He says, thank you for the presentation. I might hop off the Zoom chat soon, but I would love a question, but I would love to leave a question for you. Adding up uh, to the theme of appropriation and piracy, do you think there uh, were piracies of other Southeast Asian countries and uh, cultures in these movies? Thank you. Oh, oh that's that such a good question. You know, I don't think of the U.S. as like deeply concerned with um, large Southeast Asian countries. I mean, until, of course, obviously until Vietnam, uh, but uh, the Vietnam War, I mean. But, you know, what I think is in these films, um, and this is partly why I bring in the Murnau film, the Viador film, is this thinking about islands. There does seem to be this preoccupation with Pacific uh, more generally, you know, I would say like the ghost of Hawaii is in uh, this film and the way the U.S. conceives of Hawaii, I would say. And at that time, you know, at the time of the um, takeover of the Philippines from the Spanish Empire, the U.S. also took over Puerto Rico, Guam. So at that time, the U.S. really um, seized quite a lot of island territory from Spain, um, the Philippines included, but, you know, several other major islands. And so I think they, I think islands are on the, the US's mind and on Hollywood's mind. And maybe they thought viewers wanted to see something about what are these islands that have joined America, you know? And Brides of Sulu is one really strange way of working out an answer to that question. Um, but I think Taboo and, um, and Bird of Paradise were these similar attempts to try to give the American public some sense of what it means to be an empire that includes these tropical isles. Uh, so that's my instinct is that there's less Southeast Asia in Brides of Sulu and more this reckoning with managing Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam and the Philippines um, and yet being American and understanding a nation as like fundamentally rooted in North America. Uh, yeah. Is, but I'll have to think about that, um, the ghost of other Southeast Asian-ness in this uh, film too. I will think about that more. Thank you. Okay, we actually have questions in the room. So can we, yeah. So I, I think uh, Tomorrow's got a question. Yes. Um, which is, as I was trying to think through the same question, I immediately thought of um, Canaan. Oh, so sure. Way in which you know Siam is pulled into the debate on abolition. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. right. And so, and so you have something going on with gender, right? And ideas about you know polygyny being this you know sort of feudal, uncivilized thing. So, so my my question that I'm kind of evolving into is, you know, in in the way in which 
Siam is being used as the stand-in for them. Right. And there's scholarship looked at the kind of connections between, you know, Uncle Tom's cabin and the, the way in which, um, you know, Anna and the King gets written, right? Right. So the stand-in for thinking through slavery. Right. right? There's, I think, a whole different moment in, in American history that comes a few decades later where now as a colonizer, the, the, the issues that are being worked through are, are That's right. than being a, a slave owning nation. That's so, right. You know, the, the background of slavery is always there in terms of colonization, but it's a very different positionality yeah. as seeing yourself as a colonist yeah. with slaves. Right? And, right. and so I'm, I guess I'm wondering in terms of how gender plays out in relation to these themes around slavery and, you know, women's rights. Yeah. Ish, right? There's a totally different moment in terms of suffrage and in terms of sort of gender issues in the in the, in the US. That's right. That are in play there. And I'm wondering if you're making that comparison, although it's not at the same time period, allow you to do something, you know, by looking at both gender and um you know, mastery. Right? Totally. I, yeah. Thank you for the King and I um, reminder, because I do think something similar is going on in what we, the version of Rise of Sulu we have. So we, you know, without being able to speak to the source films, um, it seems like one framing that's possible is of um, Benita, the Datu's daughter. She's styled just like, you know, a Vivian Lee, a Hedy, a Hedy Lamar. And she is half white American too. So she has kind of the, you know, penciled in eyebrows, the exact length of hair. You know, she has a lot more cleavage on display than an actual Moro woman would ever have. And um, I think there is this implicit kind of stylistic um, argument being made that um, Benita is sort of the Asian equivalent or the island equivalent of what, you know, in the in 30s cinema seems like a quite liberated woman. Like 30s heroines in uh, European and American films are much more sort of um, in worldly and autonomous um, even than heroines of the 50s. So like gender in the 30s, I think is being reconfigured, you know, um, after this depression um, period when women really had to work if they possibly could. And also I think we're demanding a kind of place in the cultural imaginary that was just, you know, they took up more space than they had been allowed to in the past culturally. So I think there is this argument being made, like she looks just like those kinds of actresses and all she's doing is wanting a little bit of choice for herself and not to lose because she wants to be happy, you know? So that does seem like that 30s brand of feminism. Yeah, that suffragette, you know, feminism. And I think another, um, interesting, you know, issue in the U.S. at that time that might be reflected in Brides of Sulu was the miscegenation question. So this problem or question of interracial relationships seems to be at work in Brides of Sulu. Um, maybe an American audience would not pick up that these very light-skinned actors were but I think the fact that they come from different religions and that is the problem is, you know, a theme that might have resonated with people thinking through that, the miscegenation laws that were still active in a lot of these, this country until the 60s. Um, but there were in the 30s, lots of scandals and riots around interracial dating. You know, for example, Filipinos in California were specifically targeted in the Zoot Suit riots mostly because they were successful at dating white women. Um, so I think there is this like miscegenation problem, question, what could be done? It's quite divisive. People are on both sides of the issue and that would last for 30 more years. So yeah, I think um, it is one of those thorny, naughty problems in the US uh, at this time in the 30s. So thank you for surfacing how these films about the other um, that Hollywood makes can often really just be about what's going on at home, what's going on in the country, you know. Um, yeah, so thank you. So we have another in-person question from Billy Noseworthy over here. Great. Um, excellent. So I also want to build on the fact that you discussed that gender and I was kind of thinking about the 
accessible with Oh, good. Yes. And so the within the uh, sort of like broader Muslim community in Southeast Asia, it is super common to have a divided lover story where the female role is kind of Muslim. Mm. Uh, and so that's a theme that goes across the entire community. Mm. It's present in a jolly literature from the early on onward. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you could go back to 17th century manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one way that South Asian culture is that here. Um, and, and what I guess I would wonder is if maybe are there like specific, because I don't think that you know, they're just super well, um, are there specific like divided lover stories in the Philippines that may be bringing them to see that? And I was thinking about the broader context, right? So, like, in Asian literature studies, you've got Lila and Nashville, and then like butterfly lovers, but then within Southeast Asia, pretty commonly you have these stories, and especially on the um, religious borderlands for the Muslim community, Russia, and Right, and right. There is a Muslim woman and a man. I see. And yeah. The story goes out, people works. I see. Right. Yeah, right, right. So this resolves that same way where he converts in the end and they're allowed to marry, even though there's a lot of, you know, like there's the, the father's willing to enact all this violence against them. Uh, but then finally at the end, he's like, okay, you could just convert and then get married. That's fine. But yeah, I think uh, that is so great to know that there is this long tradition of a Muslim woman um, falling in love with a non-Muslim man in Asian literature that's much older than this. In the Philippines, I would point to Minda Mora, that, um, not that early 20th century uh, Zarzuela, that where it's basically exactly that plot, where a Muslim woman falls in love with a Christian man and it's, you know, thwarted from the beginning, but because she's pregnant, it forces some kind of address of her as like a person. Like, I think from what I can gather, the big revelation of Mindamora is like, the Christian man can't just cast her aside. Um, mostly because of the Christian woman's intervention, because the, the intended wife basically insists, um, you can't just forget about her, she's pregnant with your child. Like, you actually have to take care of her in some way. And that's the big uh, plot resolution. So it's not about the lovers finding happiness or tragedy. But yeah, something about responsibility and duty. And I think, you know, what, what seems to have been um, a big part or a big um, intervention Minda Mora made was that the Muslim girl got to be the heroine or she got to be kind of not fully tragic heroine, but semi-tragic, you know, but she was centered that her, her emotional journey is the point. So, um, I think there, this is this is how um, in Filipino storytelling, the Muslim figure seems to represent all these different things, you know? Um, the Muslims are the other, the rebel, the rebels, um, the barbarians and savages, but also sort of the, um, you know, they, they occupy sometimes that like noble savage um, spot in the narrative like uh, Native Americans do. And sometimes they occupy that interesting other that should that is exotic, but also is the whole point of the story. Uh, so we should focus on them like, um, you know, Miss Saigon does. <laughs> so I think that there's all these different functionalities of the Muslim character in, in these narratives. And they're not all, you know, they're neither all heroic positions nor all villainous positions. Um, but thank you for pointing out the history of the literature, which does seem really important. And, you know, like I was saying in Spanish literature, that those tropes go back to the eighth century. So these are old stories in a way. Yeah. And mostly about political conquest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I wonder if it's not 
Mm-hmm. Right. I, I have wondered that too. I'm actually not 100% convinced about the re-editing argument because while I do see that, um, or rather what I see is like some documentary footage, you know, and it does seem like some kind of ethnographic filming potentially um, has gone on to capture these moments of moral life. And then there is a story. (laughs) So there's a story, there's a narrative, that part of the film, and then there's all this ethnographic, um, all this ethnographic film. And I, and yeah, I'm not 100% convinced that is part of the Moro Pirates project by Nepomuceno. Like, seems to me a narrative film might proceed a bit differently. Whereas U.S. cinema, you know, U.S. movie makers were very interested in these ethnographic documentary type projects. So I think it is possible that there was a U.S. crew uh, filming the Moros. Um, I don't totally count that out. Uh, So, you know, they probably didn't exactly find what the narrator said they found, but um, it's easy, yeah, I think it would be easy for the narrator to remake what the findings of the the graphic project were. But what if it was just government, um, kind of standard government stock or something, as opposed to, you know, some narrative film made by the great early silent film director? Uh, I guess that that remains an open question. I mean, as far as I know, almost all of Apocalypse Now was filmed in the Philippines. So I think um, your pointing to Apocalypse Now is really interesting because it, it, makes that point of how you can film something in the Philippines that is not at all related to your project and you can make it a part of your project. And that is exactly what happened with the the slaughter of the um, water buffalo sequence. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, we got uh, another question from talk in the back. Mm. 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 Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, Hollywood is the real pirate, you know, um, and then those films, those early films made by American directors do serve as archive too. Um, so like one of the, uh, I think almost the, no, the first film that was ever censored in, in this country was of a Lebanese belly dancer. Uh, you know, because it was too erotic or something like that. But but we also have a record then of that performance. My student Juliana um, studies that particular instance of an Edison film and how it traveled. Uh, but an, another early Edison film captures the ghost dance. Um, other kinds of Edison projects uh, captured, you know, I, island peoples throughout Pacifica, Africa. I mean, these stand as um, definitely these ethnographic documentarian type projects, I think because maybe there was this um, this speculation that American audiences wanted to see these parts of the world and these people they would never encounter. Um, but you know, what they end up being is an archive both of like, the American racist worldview and just this idea of cultural imperialism um, or technological imperialism. And, and also though, also those, those cultures are on screen. They do appear in the history of cinema, you know? So um, it's troubling, I think. It's troubling how much capture of these cultures, how much archiving of these cultures was done from this perspective. Uh, but a great deal of it was for sure. A drama of the wilderness. Yeah, right. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
And King Kong is um, one, of the, one of those movies that you're talking about, I think, where, you know, really trying to reckon with Blackness in this metaphorical way. Yeah, this like displaced way. So that was really interesting. I would say that term wilderness is very loaded because, um, you know, the Indian Wars didn't really conclude until 1880. And so early cinema makers absolutely had um, the logics of the wars against indigenous peoples, you know, in their head, maybe even in their bodies and their experiences, or they had known veterans of those wars. And they, you know, as soon as the wars were over, the Wild West shows began. So in between the end of the wars against indigenous peoples and before cinema was this like real thick history of live performance live recreations of this war, that of these many wars that were about settling the wilderness. And that term wilderness, that framing of where indigenous peoples live in um, North America is really about minusing out the people, like as if it's just wilderness, if it's, as, as if it's just empty. And it's just waiting for brave hardy pioneers to go in and build houses or something. So I do think that wilderness part of the, um, the, the Elephant Chong, you know, movie in Thailand is quite marketed because it brings the Thai in relation to the indigenous peoples of the United States through that term wilderness. Um, and of course the drama of wilderness, that full subtitle, the drama of wilderness in North America was about this, these, you know, really long sequence of wars against indig indigenous peoples and society. So like, it's really heavy actually, I think that that subtitle, I'm gonna have to think about that more. I'm gonna have to get a hold of that. <laughs> that sounds really like a must, must viewing. Yeah. Yeah, we had a subtitle Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Mm. I see, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. I, I didn't, I've never heard that about the marketing of early 20th century American photography to an American public that featured the Philippines in it as this place that you should get to know because you, you own this place, you know, like it's yours, part of us. So you should understand what it is and who lives there and that kind of thing. But that makes perfect sense. Uh, it, it ties in with a lot of other logics of photography of the time. So, uh, and, and even just what leisure is and what photography, you know, how photography, education and entertainment or leisure all kind of we're supposed to go together often. So thank you for that. I, I will I will ask your partner for more details about that piece of it. I think that um, I agree it's weirdly introductory level uh, because today we don't see, for example, movies about Hawaii where we have to tell mainlanders what is Hawaii. You know, like we don't have little maps of Hawaii and show the plane flying from Los Angeles to Hawaii and like, this is a part of America, you know, like we don't have that kind of very intro 101 text about those islands. So I think it is interesting that 30 years after the colonization begins, that somehow we're still at level 101. That's a great um, observation and something we're thinking about in terms of how Hawaii is incorporated into the national domestic imaginary and the Philippines never was. So that is a really important marker, you know, even though the Philippines has been used even more than Hawaii 
as a military staging ground for the US military, for instance, you know, like there are all these ways that the Philippines has really mattered um, to the US strategically, um, like its proximity to Vietnam and I mean, Japan and many other reasons, China. And so like, it's interesting that the, that the Philippines is never really a part of the US even when it formally is um, and never fully incorporated into the level of, um, of yeah, just kind of ordinary mainstream American thinking, even though like everywhere I go, somebody has a story about being, you know, like um, having their R&R be in, in somewhere in the Philippines. So it's like, so many Americans have been there. Most of the people have gone through the military, I will say, but uh, it's odd, yeah, how little that place is known to Americans given the tight relationship uh, between, so. Yeah, that's a great, that's a very provocative, you know, like line of thought. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I, I am loving this Q&A. <laughs> but thank you, like, we just want to say thank you so much for to, to Gail for your provocative and like innovative and, inform, and informative talk. And we get like a free movie out of it, you know? <laughs> um, so um, do you have any, I guess, like, close, like, uh, Comments you want to leave us with? Yeah, yeah. I think we you know, covered a lot of really great ground. Thank you so much. It was a fun journey. <laughs> so um, yeah, if, if we all could give like a warm round of applause to uh, Gail. To do that. Yeah. And I guess I just have like an announcement for uh for next week. So this is our penultimate Gaddy. And um, so our final Gaddy is next Thursday. Um I mean, wait, is it May 5th? Next Thursday? I think it is. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> so we return to the Philippines and see the sea um, for uh, our final Gaddy speaker, uh, Kale Bantigi Fajardo, for his talk titled Boats, Waters, and Queer Figures in Contemporary Philippine Cinema. Totally not like, this is totally just um, a coincidence that our last two just tie so well together. <laughs> um, but yes, until then, uh, please take care of yourselves and enjoy the weather as it gradually warms up here. Let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>